Hi everyone, so in this mini lecture we're going to be focusing mainly on stuff that you're going to need for the next lab. Um, so let's just refresh our memory about the ESP32. So this is our system on chip module that we're using during the course. We have our dual core processor here, a bunch of hardware peripherals. And in the first couple labs what we were doing is learning how to program this microprocessor here and how to write code that can interface with hardware. Right, so how we can use memory mapped hardware. Then we moved on and we started looking at how you would actually build such a system. How would you describe the hardware using Verilog? What we're going to do now is, is try and bridge that gap. Right, So in this lab, what we're going to do is we're going to write code that will interface with some hardware peripherals. And then we're actually going to make the hardware peripherals out of Verilog and, and see how that connection happens. Okay, so in the past labs, we've interacted with things like GPIO through register interfaces, but now we're going to go for a slightly more complicated hardware circuit and interact with it from software. And the peripheral that we're going to interact with and then ultimately describe in hardware is a, oh, whoops, sorry, is a timer module. And so a timer module is essentially something that, you know, it's a dedicated piece of hardware separate from the CPU that we can use to keep track of time in the system. So generally embedded systems use these a lot, right? If you need to wake up from particular events or if you need to process data at a regular interval and things like that, then trying to keep track of time with a processor is very difficult. You might remember, or like with a CPU that's running software, you might remember from the GPIO lab, when you were toggling the pins, you noticed a lot of variation in the frequency and the execution time. And this is due to lots of things, right? This is due to other interrupts in the system that might, you know, take control of the processor for a little while. It could be due to instruction scheduling, kind of jitter and, and delays in the, in the actual processor pipeline itself. And all of these effects make keeping accurate track of time quite difficult and challenging. So for this reason, embedded systems generally have dedicated separate hardware whose one specific function is to keep track of time. And then they can do things like generate interrupts, which we'll learn about in a later lecture, um, to process very event various events and things like that. So you'll have your you'll have your CPU and then off the side, you'll have like some hardware timers. And there'll be a number of these. So this might be timer zero, let's say, timer one. And you might configure them to count at different rates. Now, how these timers basically work is you have they need to be sequential circuits, right? Because they're storing a value and, and it's essentially they're like a counter, okay? So the simplest timer is a counter. That every clock cycle So if this is the clock input, every clock cycle, every clock edge looks at its value and just adds one to it. We can then read off this value and then use that to keep track of time. And so this is running completely independently from the CPU, right? So this counter will just keep counting clock cycles in the background and the CPU can do whatever processing it likes. It can then look at the counter, see what values there and then know quite accurately or very accurately, how much time has elapsed. Now, they need to be a little bit more complicated than this because we, you know, oftentimes you want quite a flexible range of values that you can actually count over, right? Or that you can time. So if we have, let's say, a very, very fast clock, right? So like maybe something that's going at many, many or hundreds of megahertz, 
then um, every single clock tick can measure a very, very small amount of time. So we have a very high resolution, right? But that means that quite quickly, your counter will overflow, right? So you'll, you'll count up to the maximum number that your counter can count to. That just depends on the number of bits. And then it will overflow and go back to zero. So there's, there's sort of like a maximum range that you can count, right? Which is how, how long does it take your counter to actually overflow? And then there's a maximum resolution that you can count, which is how quickly can your clock rate increase the, the counter value. So there's different trade-offs there and, and different applications will require different things. Let's say you want to time bits of execution in your code to very, very high precision, then you're going to want that clock to be going as fast as possible. You're going to want to you know, get super high resolution. But there might be times where you're designing an embedded system that um, goes to sleep for a really long period of time to save power. So maybe let's say it's a sensor, like what you'll be doing in the coursework where you make your power sensor. It'll be a sensor that will read a value, um, read a value like a temperature value or some kind of sensor value, and then it'll go to sleep for an extended period of time and uh, wake up. And that could be months or years even that it could go to sleep for. And so in this case, you want your clock to tick by very, very slowly. Um, you're not necessarily worried about the resolution, but you want to make sure that that maximum time that you can time is very long. And for this reason, the design is usually a little bit more complicated. So usually what we have um, is we'll have our clock coming in. And the first thing that I will go into is a divider. And so this is something that basically just divides the clock, right? So we've got like a divided clock coming out. Okay, so if let's say this is our clock signal, then our divided clock, why if we're dividing the clock by two, might only go high every second clock edge. So this would be a divide by two um, kind of setup, right? So we have a slower clock that's going in. And this is usually configurable, right? So usually you'll have some value that you're putting in here, div file maybe, um, where you're saying by how much you're dividing the clock by. So this would be uh, like divide by two. But you could do it much higher, right? You could divide it by 255 or something. Okay, so you get this slower clock coming out and this will drive the counter. Okay, and so here, usually with these hardware timers, you'll have some more things that you can kind of configure. You might have a maximum count where you say that once it reaches this value, you wrap around and it goes back to zero. So this is kind of different to, let's say, kind of just a basic counter where you'll count up to the maximum value and then wrap around there when it overflows. Here you can actually set a maximum value that it will count out to. So this, this greatly increases our flexibility, right? We can divide the clock, um, divide the clock by quite a, a large amount slow it down a lot and get really large periods of time that we can measure or we can divide it not very much or not at all and get very high resolution um, timing information but maybe not count as long a period of time okay so the other thing that these often have is um, some sort of way to generate interrupts. And so this is called an alarm, usually with timers. And basically what this means is you can set, you can set the timer up such that when it reaches a certain value, um, such a certain value in the counter, it'll generate a signal that you can use to trigger the execution of other things in the system. For this lab and for this lecture, we're not gonna worry about this quite yet, but we will be looking at this quite soon.
Okay. So let's look at our like the specific timer modules on the ESP32. So here I've got the big scary technical reference manual for the ESP32. And if we scroll down, um, there will be a big section somewhere. Do, 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 do. Big section here on timer group. And so, you know, it's a group because there's a bunch of timers here. And so if we click on this, we go down to chapter 18, which is the timer group. And um, it gives you a bit of information about what this looks like on the ESP32. So what I called a divider, they're calling a prescaler. And they're saying that it's a 16-bit one meaning that you know the maximum that we can divide our clock by is 65,536. This is 2 to the power of 16, right? You can see then that it's got a counter. So the counter is, is in this case, a 64-bit counter. So we have an awful lot of bits. It's a big counter, right? Um, we have an awful lot of bits that we can count up. We can do things like we can configure the timer to count up or down, so it can be incrementing or decrementing. Um, we can do things like capture, capture, so halt and resume the timer uh, so that we can read off the values without it moving. Um, set an alarm, we're not gonna look at the alarm right now. And then that's linked to the interrupt generation as well. Okay, so I think down here is there a diagram? There is no diagram. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, so here we can talk, like it talks a bit more about these two main units. So the two main units are, are the, the prescalers, or the divider, it's sometimes called, and um, the clock divider, and uh, the, the, the counter. Right? So these are the two main units of the timer peripheral. So we've got the 16-bit prescaler here, and it talks about how each timer, so there's a few timers, I think it says how many, um, or four. We have four general purpose timers that we can use in the ESP32. They're all 64 bit. They have all have a 16 bit prescaler, so 16 bit divider, and 64 bit up or down counters. So the 16 bit prescaler, um, all of them have the input clock, which is the APB clock, which runs at 80 megahertz. So in this clock here, for all the timers on the ESP32 is running at 80 megahertz. This is then a 16-bit value that we can use to configure the divider, and the counter is 64 bits. Okay. Oh, whoops, wrong one. So we've got an 80 megahertz input clock, and then we can change um, the divider clock by setting a particular register. So depending on which timer you're using, you set a different register. Um, so you can configure them all differently. And it says here that we can divide from 2 to 65,536. So when that divider value that we set in the register is either 1 or 2, the clock is divided by 2. <laughs> and when it's 0, then the clock is divided by, by 1. Oh no, sorry. When, when it's 0, the clock is divided by the maximum value. Uh, 65,536. Okay, so there is like some quirks about this divider value that you need to take care of when you're um, kind of configuring this thing. Okay, so let's actually think about how we configure this. So um, we know we've got all these values that we need to set, right? There's some extra ones as well. So there's things like we need to actually set an enable bit to enable the divider. Uh, there's max count. There's also things that we can do to like load it. So if this is the output as well, we know that this is 64 bits. Um, okay. We know that the input clock is 80 megahertz. Ooh, didn't leave enough space for that. And how, how we go about configuring this and reading the timer values off and all that kind of stuff is through, you guessed it, memory mapped registers. Right? So there will be a few com registers to do different things. Um, there's usually like one configuration register that, that'll be used to do a few things. Usually, you know, there'll be some bits that will kind of map to the enable bit, and then there'll be like a range of bits that will map to the divider value. 
Um, oh yeah, we could also set things like if this uh, increments or decrements, right? So there'll probably be a bit for that. Um, and then there'll be bits for, you know, actually configuring things like the, the maximum count value that you can go up to. Um, and there'll probably be bit like a uh, memory mapped registers for actually reading off the counter value. And what's interesting here, and this is something that we're going to have to pay attention to, is that because this is 64 bit and we've got a 32 bit system, right? Everything in our system is 32 bits. So all of these registers are 32 bits. Um, however, we have a 64 bit timer output. And so what this means is that there will be two registers for this. There will be like the upper 32 bits. And then there'll be another 32 bit register for the lower 32 bits, right? So when we're writing our code to interface with this, we're going to need to read two registers and then stitch those two registers together to get our full 64-bit uh, counter value. Okay. Now the details of all these registers are again in the technical reference manual. So if I go back up to the technical reference manual and if we scroll down here to the bottom, we can see that they're here. So there's the configuration register. And so this is used for doing things like setting up the divider or the, or the prescaler, the enable bits, um, maybe if it's incrementing or decrementing. Um, and then there'll be other registers as well. So low and high. So this is the timer's current value, the, the lower 32 bits, right? So that's this one here. And then we've got the, the upper 32 bits, which is here. So it's been split into these two registers. Um, the alarm we're not worried about. There's also, we can also load a value into the timer. So there's, you know, we can set up registers such that we write values into them and then we send a signal that says, okay, load these values into the timer and it'll load them in. And so there's a load low register and there's a load high register as well. And then there's these special registers. Um, so these registers here, so update register and load register, are write only, so you can't read any value out of them, and they have these funny properties in that they're not really like memory, just whenever you read or whenever you write to them, it triggers an event. So here, when we write to the load register, it'll take this, lo um, the load low value and the load high value that we, we put into those registers and then load that into the counter. So there are some registers that like trigger an event that we need to be aware of. Right, for all of these registers, we can find out a bit more information about them if we actually click on them or scroll down. So, you know, each register will do a few different, some of them have one job, but mo like especially the configuration register will have a few different jobs. And so each, in like there will be individual bits that will do different things. So here we can see that bit 31 um, enables the counter. So this is, you know, you, you set this bit to turn the counter on. Um, there is increase here, which actually causes the counter to increment every clock tick. So this is, you know, this is setting it to increment. If, you if this is zero, then the counter will decrement. So this is kind of saying whether you want the counter to count up or down. And then here we have in the middle, all these bits here from 28 down to 13, we have that divider value for how we want to divide the clock. The other stuff down here is then all the interrupt stuff, which we can ignore, right? Okay. Now we have timer low and timer high. So you can see that these are just kind of values that you read. They're not, there's, you know, no breakdown of the bits for these because they're just doing one job each. All the bits here are, are related to reading the lower part of the timer or the higher upper part of the timer. And then here we have this update register. So actually what's happening is um, this counter, so if I just erase this real quick, this counter is, is constantly counting It's going up and up and up. Um, and then when we have, 
there's kind of like these registers here that essentially have a write enable on them. So they're not always updating, right? So the, the counter value is split and it's sent into here. So you know, this is 32 bits and 32 bits, or this is the lower part, upper 32 bits. And this write enable controls when we actually save these values. So it's kind of like we take a snapshot of it as it's running. Because if you think about it, if we have a upper 32 bits and a lower 32 bits, this is two separate read operations that we have to do. And in the CPU, there could be significant time between those two read operations. You might have noticed this with the last part of the, the GPIO lab, where you were toggling, you were using memory mapped pointers to toggle, you know, all like six pins at the same time, and two of them were in a different set of registers. And when you toggled them, they would be kind of out of sync with each other, right? Because there is various delays and things in the CPU. So the same effect can happen here. And so for that reason, they have this update signal that controls the write enable. So there's this extra register here called update. And whenever any write is detected on this register, it essentially just opens up for one clock cycle the write enable on these registers and saves the values. So it like takes a snapshot of them. So that's what this is doing here. So how you would read the timer value out is you would send a write to this register, which would then load the value of the timer into high register and low register, and then you would read off these individual registers. Now let, let's actually look at lab five. So um, in particular task one, let's just look at lab five task one to start with. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna, I've got some code, some base code already in task one. Um, where I have some stuff that's basically setting up a timer and then resetting the timer, um, the timer value, delaying for a bit and then printing out the timer value, right? So I've got this kind of set up here. Uh, there's also a function for setting up the timer. And uh, these functions at the moment are empty. And what I want you to do is to use those memory mapped registers that I just showed in the, in the previous part of the, the lecture um, to actually implement these functions, right? So task one has three steps. Uh, the first one is to construct or implement the setup timer function. Step two is to um, implement the reset timer. So, you know, resetting the timer value back to zero. And then the third one is actually reading the 64-bit value off. Um, so I've picked one of the timer modules to use and I've gotten all the addresses for the important registers for you out of there because it was a little little bit confusing how the it's done in the technical reference manual. So if you look, there's like, you know, uh, timer group M, timer zero, and they all have different things. So I've just picked kind of the first timer, which is in timer group zero, timer zero, and I've gotten all the addresses of the registers for you. Um, so those are down here. So, you know, this is config register. Um, and then I've given you the technical reference manual reference for them. So 18.1 for the configuration register. And so if you scroll down through here, you'll see 18.1. Uh, and then that will kind of give you a breakdown of what all the individual bits are doing for that register. Okay, and so I've also got a little hint or a little bit of info here used to configure the timer. Uh, the timer. Um, then we have low, the bottom 32 bits of the timer, high, the upper 32 bits. And then we have this update uh, for, you know, kind of capturing the value of the counter in these bits here. And we also have these for, for loading them. So, you know, you'd write zero into this. Or if you want to reset the timer, let's say you would write zero into the low, zero into the high, and then any write any value to the load register. And that would kind of copy these into the timer. So that's what I want you to do first. I want you to create some uh, memory map pointers to those registers and then set the bits and check to make sure that your timer is working. So you can see up here, I've kind of actually created the pointers for you already. So there's, um, you know, the config registers here. So you can you can use these registers up here to actually do, do the memory mapped operations. Um, to check that it's actually working, 
what I want you to do is to kind of perform a little calculation. Now you don't need to prove this to me in, in the logbook. I'm not going to check that. But this is more for like your own sanity check. Um, and how I would do it is I've got I've got setup timer here set to divide the the clock value by uh, 16, right? So if we go back to here, oh, let me just grab this. So we've got our divider here. We know our input clock is 80 megahertz, right? Um, in that setup function here, uh, the input argument is the divider value. So here we're dividing, you know, we're dividing this by 16. So you can work out what the output clock is from this. Um, and then in our counter, we are in that loop we're resetting the timer, delaying for one second. Remember the delay functions in milliseconds, and then we're printing out the timer value. So on serial, you should see kind of the counter value coming out um, over serial, and you should get a value out. You know, it'll be kind of a a number of some sort uh, being printed out, which will actually be the the counter value that you're seeing. And so if you know the the let's call this the div clock. If you know the divider clock value here, um, then one over div clock. So the the frequency of this clock gives you the period between counts. So um, you know this this is equal to every single time this goes up by one. And so if we take this value, if we take this value right and we multiply it by our counter value that we're getting, this should be pretty close to one second. Okay. Um, so this is kind of like a quick sanity check that you can do to make sure that this code is actually doing what you want. So you look at serial, you see that it's printing out the timer value with the display timer, and then uh, the value that you get by doing a little bit of maths, you can work out kind of roughly what, uh, if it's working correctly. Now in reality, the value that I seem to get when I try to do this isn't quite a second, it's actually a bit smaller. It's like 0 0.999 seconds or something like that. It's, um, and this is probably down to the resolution of the timer or, or something, or the resolution of delay. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but it, you should get like a value that's re really close. Um, so that's task one. Let's now look at task two. Okay, for task uh, two, what we're going to be doing is um, writing some code that does the, the, the same thing that you did in task one and writing some hardware that actually is a hardware timer, right? So you're actually going to be constructing the hardware timer and we're going to be simulating this whole thing in Verilator. Okay, so I've set something up in Verilator where we can write um, some software code in C, and this sort of simulates our um, Arduino sketch that's running on the tiny Pico. So we have a setup function and we have a loop function. And we can write this software and then actually write some hardware in Verilog and simulate these two things simultaneously. So we can we can perform memory mapped operations that will you know be in be in the software and actually send transactions down into our hardware simulation. And then run them in the simulation. So there, you know, we can we can read and write um, from hardware registers in here. Whoops. And simulate the entire system, both the software side and the hardware side. Um, to do this, I have some kind of wrapper hardware around here 
that performs like memory mapped kind of IO interface. So I give you this, right? I give you some hardware that will actually like um, kind of demonstrate how to read and write to registers here. And there's some signals here like the address and the data going in. Um, and I've got a video on how to do that, which in the lab it links to. Now up here in the software code, um, it can't unfortunately be exactly the same as the Arduino code. And the reason for this is that this is actually running on um, the CPU in the system. I'm not simulating the processor on the ESP32. I'm actually running this on your CPU and then it's sending messages into the hardware simulation, right? So it's not quite a true full simulation, but I'm using the CPU as sort of like the CPU simulator. And what this means is that I, you can't create a pointer to a memory address in the hardware Verilog and it will work. So you're not, you're not going to be using pointers to interface with the hardware. You're going to be using two functions instead. There's going to be reg um, write and reg read. Um, reg write Reg write actually takes two arguments. You give it the address and then the data that you want to, to write into your register. Um, reg read just takes the address and um, and returns the value right from that register. So we can use these two functions and actually interface with our hardware. And so then what I want you to do is to build your counter hardware in here um, and actually build your timer and have it kind of connect up to the memory mapped interface. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the code for doing that. So here um, I kind of give a breakdown. So in lab five task two, there's a few files, right? There's the software driver.h. And what software driver.h is, is this file here. So this is our Arduino-like code that we can use to interact via memory mapped kind of operations with our hardware simulation. And then we have timer.sv, which is our Verilog that's going to describe where you're going to describe your hardware timer peripheral. There's some other things too, such as the make file, which you'll use for actually running the simulation. So um, if let's let's actually go in and take a look. So task two, software driver to start with. Um, so again, I give you all those registers, but remember you're not going to be using pointers. You will use these functions up here. So reg write, where you give it this address here, and then you can write some data into it, and reg read, uh, where you you know you can give it the address and it will return the value. Um, I have some other functions here too. So there's an exit function which just ends the simulation. Um, otherwise it will run forever and it won't display a GTK wave graph for looking at your hardware. And then there's this delay function um, which is similar to the delay function in uh, Arduino but it's not delaying in milliseconds. It's delaying in number of clock cycles of the simulation. And so down here you have a setup function just like you would in Arduino and then the loop function here. But the loop function is a little bit different because it's got, you know, it just exits after it's timed 10 times. So for task, for the first step of task two, what I want you to do is re-implement uh, in the exact same way as you did for the Arduino, the setup timer, reset timer, and read function, but this time using the reg write and reg read, just so that you have the same software kind of uh, driving your code, essentially just using slightly different ways to interact with the hardware. And then for task two, what I want you to do is to actually build the hardware. Um, so for, for using those like functions for reading and writing, I have some examples here as well. Um, right, and then the first thing that I recommend that you do is to actually build the timer hardware without the prescaler, so without the divider, right? Just ignore the divider to start with and build um, the, the timer hardware for doing that. Um, and then the later step is then to add that prescaler. So let's just have a quick look at the, 
at the actual hardware. So if I go into task two, here in timer.sv, we've got the Verilog for that. And um, here I give you some examples. So I kind of, I give you a bit of the config register already implemented there. So here we've got, you know, the address um, and it writes the data into the configuration register. And then I also have sort of like, so that's for writing this synchronous sequential logic blocks for writing to the configuration register. And then I give you the one for reading as well. So you can kind of copy this template for implementing the other registers, right? The other thing I give you is that there was, there was those special registers, right? Where you didn't um, actually store a value or read a value out, but instead just writing any value to them would trigger something such as the update register or the load register. So I give you an example of that as well. So there's, um, uh, I, I implement kind of part of the load register where any write to this register, you know, you don't worry about whatever the data coming in is, it will trigger a load for one clock cycle. Uh, so it'll trigger the signal to go high. So I give you that example that you can kind of work from as well. And so that, that's what I want you to do. I want you to go through, uh, take the code that you've got for configuring your hardware timer and then start to actually construct the timer circuit, just the basic one to start with and then one with the, the prescaler or clock divider um, there. Cool, okay, so, um, and again, how you can check that this is working is um, with these parameters, let's say setup timer four, delay 100, um, in software driver, you should see this getting printed out when you do make. Um, and then I've got some other parameters as well where you should see some values. There will be some kind of slight variation in the values because this is running on your processor and this is kind of a separate thread and the, there is some like asynchronous communication between the two which can cause some slight variation delay. So d don't worry if they're like off slightly. Um, as long as they're roughly right, then it, then it should be fine. Or right most of the time. Um, Okay, and you can also use GTK Wave and look at the waveforms and actually see these signals. For the memory mapped interface, I know I kind of glossed over it there, but the reason that I did that is because there is actually other videos explaining this. So if you go to this link here, um, I made a video where I actually go through the memory mapped interface in a bit more detail um, and probably better than I would in this video right now. So I'd recommend like when you get to the memory mapped interface bit, watch that video and go through it. Okay, cool. Um, for submissions, I just, I'm looking for code. Uh, so you just need to submit, in task two, you just need to submit timer.sv. And likewise for task one, you just need to actually submit task one to INO. Um, and yeah, feel free to message me on the Discord or uh, drop me an email if you're getting stuck with anything. And of course you can come along to the lab sessions as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much everyone. I'm sorry that this video was a little late. Um, but yeah, good luck with the lab. Let me know how you get on. Bye.